Um, a couple more folks. Okay. <coughs> So I get 90 seconds and then there's like 30 second rebuttal. Is that how it works? Mm -hmm. All right. Point, counterpoint. Oh. I love it. All right. Who, who has the punch? Do you want to <laughs> shut the door? Or do you want to? No, I think they're Yeah. All right, great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining uh, Creating a Career Path within the Drupal community. My name is Sally Shaughnessy. I'm the Director of Project Management with Atten Design Group. We're a Denver based. Uh, full-service digital agency, and we love Drupal. Uh, so, uh, oh, thank you. Yep, there we go. 1982, Sally. Um, so, <laughs> thank you to Lynn Winter for setting up this panel. This is going to be a lot of fun, a lot of diverse perspectives here, and uh, these folks are not shy, as you've probably already heard. So just to set the table a little bit, we are going to allow these folks to introduce their own career path, their history, and what got them to where they are today. Um, like any good Agile PM, I'm going to time box them. And then we'll go into some Q&A. So I have a few questions. I'll kick the conversation off. And then there's a microphone right here in the room. I invite anybody to come up. There are uh, no dumb questions. This crew is ready. So with that. Why don't we kick it off here? So with some introductions, we have Lynn Winter. She is a digital strategist. She's been a little bit of everything in her career, content strategy, digital strategist, PM, et cetera. We have Stephanie El Haj, PM from Amazie. We have Darren Peterson from Lullabot. And we have Joe Crespo, director of accounts at Atten Design Group. All right, so who wants to go first? And Give us your introduction. How did you get to where you are? Wait, didn't, don't we have like a slide deck that will determine who goes first? Yes. We can do that. <laughs> sure. Surprise. <Excellent>. Yay! <laughs> I love it. Cool. Um, so I'm Stephanie Elhaj. I work at uh, Amazie Labs. I wanted to just reiterate what she said in case you'd forgotten in the last 30 seconds. Um, so uh, I'm a project manager. I didn't start out to be a project manager. I don't want to be a project manager. Um, so my story will kind of tell you how I ended up here and all the things that I do that are not project management-ish. Like <laughs> <laughs> uh, so once upon a time, I was young and I wore bows in my hair. Um, <laughs> uh, so I got my start uh, in 2007. Um, I was not supposed to be a project manager. I took um, cl uh, classes to uh, be a marketing and advertising person. Um, in my head, I was going to be Don Draper, and I was going to drink whiskey all day and live the glamorous life and produce those uh, ads that you see in the magazine and be very witty and stylish. And as you can see, that worked partially. Um, as I uh, as I started to learn more about what the advertising world was, I was like, oh, I have to learn about like ad buys. Mm, this is not the thing I thought it was going to be. Uh, and a very, apparently, it's a very stressful environment. I read a book that told me all about how stressful uh, being in the advertising agency is and how uh, people burn out after like three years of really producing like, their life's best work. And I was like, eh, I need something a little bit more sustainable uh, to go after. So I still got my degrees because I didn't want to go back and learn something else and pay for that. Um, but it didn't ever benefit me learning these two things. The, the best part about my education was the business administration part of it. Um, so I got my introduction to spreadsheets this way, uh, which was kind of like the beginning of the end. Um, let's see. So uh, when I graduated college, I actually started out as an event planner, um, which was a great thing for a college kid to do, uh, is to plan professional events for, uh, for a professional organization. So I started out with the Software Association of Oregon, which is now like the Technology Association of Oregon. Um, they put me in charge of making sure that technology professionals, C-level uh, individuals learned each other and all the latest industry things. Um, and I got a chance to order beer kegs on the company dime. Uh, and that was also the beginning of the end. So I realized that I had a knack for party planning. Um, and so uh, through that, I got to meet people like Senator Ron Wyden. We did giant events like that. And so I kind of learned crowd control, chaos management. Um, and communicating with people who were different than me. So that was my first foray into talking to nerds. Um, I worked with people like Microsoft and Regis and different giant organizations like that, and I was too young to know that that was impressive at the time. Uh, so it was just a really nice way of like learning my way around uh, that environment. 
Sorry, I feel like I'm taking a long time. Um, so, so after um, I was a uh, event planner for Software Association of Oregon, I was hired at the Drupal Association to run DrupalCon. So I helped run DrupalCon from 2012 from Denver to 2015 Barcelona. Um, and I helped produce DrupalCon, so I was the one who took all of the community efforts um, associated with DrupalCon and, made, and formalized them, and made things, um, made things like formalizing uh, how the schedule works, how session selection works, things like, let, things like that. Uh, so I was able to take my organizational uh, aspects and put it into uh, creating this gigantic DrupalCon process thing. Um, so after the Drupal Association, I joined Amazy Labs. Um, the people who I worked with at Amazy Labs I'd also worked with at DrupalCon, um, they were my volunteers and they, for whatever reason, thought that the way that I managed DrupalCon is exactly what they wanted to do, uh, what they wanted me to do for them um, at the Austin office uh, for Amazy. Sorry, I need to take a breath. <laughs> so uh, one of the things about um, being a project manager that is different from being an event planner or being like a DrupalCon planner is that uh, when you're planning events, everything you do is waterfall. You know that you know, on May 16th you're going to have X and X event and you have so many weeks to get there. And so I learned all of the things about budgeting and getting there and making sure that all the right people were involved. And then when I started with Amazy, I learned that all of that was exactly the opposite, the opposite thing that you wanted to do for an agile company. So I learned uh, a lot of the things um, do correlate. So budgets, obviously, you're going to need to um, have uh, the people that you work with. Are gonna, you need to have clear communication about what kinds of things and expectations that the project is going to have. Um, and it's just a really nice way to see how my events kind of flowed into this new, uh, this new job. Oh, and the end. <laughs> and suddenly, <laughs> you aged. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, um, my name's Joe Crespo. I'm, oh, oh, I have a clicker now. Okay. I haven't looked at these slides in like eight weeks, so I apologize if I go out of sequence. I'm just going to make up my life story as I go. Um, my name is Joe Crespo. I'm director of accounts at Atten Design Group. I actually work with Sally. Um, uh, I, I've, yeah, this is, Sally's like the best PM I've ever seen, so it feels weird to be sitting here, but in any event. Um, what, Oh, how did I, I, so I actually started my uh, career as a graphic designer. I did desktop publishing. I, I was a gopher at like a place that did really terrible magazines and then uh, learned how to use uh, Photoshop and Illustrator and Quark at the time. Does anybody use Quark ever? Oh, are they still in like 3.3, like nowadays? <laughs> I feel like in like a glacial uh, upgrade path. Um, in any event, uh, I figured that I figured I figured out how to use these uh, applications. I hung out a shingle. I made some really terrible logos from some very small businesses. Somebody said, "Hey, can you do uh, website design?" And I said, "Yeah, why not?" So then I went to a bookstore, bought a book, figured it out, lost my shirt, became uh, eventually a website designer, then a website developer, then a project manager. Um, oh, and I all did this because I needed a day job. I was a musician, um, and you know, I, I, my big claim to fame uh, in my music, professional music career was that I joined bands just before their label dropped them, and I quit bands just before they got picked up. That was my, uh, <laughs> you know, like I did that for a long time. This is the coolest picture I could possibly get. This is the only currency I ever made doing it. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see. Oh, and yeah, so then, then I became this developer working from home, this freelancer for forever. Um, and then I, I discovered Drupal at some point, which was uh, really spectacular. I'd been building my own CMSs, which is... Uh, are there any developers here in, in, at all? Okay. Hey. Oh, right on. And uh, don't, don't become project managers. This is, this is <laughs> if there's one lesson to take away from this. No, I, I, I ended up, like, I built some terrible uh, CMSs, discovered Drupal and, like, fieldable entities, and that's, like, that, like you know, it really just blew my mind uh, just, just on that alone. And then um, came to work at Atten uh, as a developer, uh, joined the team. They were really spectacular. They were like, oh, this guy's got the gift of gab. They made me an account manager. They actually tricked me into being a project manager. They said, oh, 
Uh, you're going to put you on a support team. We'll put you on some small things. Uh, you'll just talk to the clients. You'll get the requirements. And then you'll just do the work. Do, do the work. And then, you know, those engagements went well. And they said, hey, why don't you take on some work counts? You know, you can do the work. But, you know, you, it's going to be too much work for you. So why don't you get a couple of other developers involved? And then they were like, you know what? These are going well. Why don't you take on a few more accounts? I'm probably not going to have any time for development. Um, just be an account manager. I took, a, took on the uh, support team and then started working on projects. And it's been spectacular. Um, I wanted to be a product owner at, at some point. I actually did uh, I become Scrum certified. And I started, like, uh, swinging, swinging the incense and wearing the robes. And I have an altar to Agile at home. Um, I'm a big advocate. It's... It's been uh, super fun. Yeah, and I have this, like, I, like started going low tech and uh, getting really excited about actually, like, doing post-its and whiteboards and stuff like that. And uh, that's the end of my career. Here I am today. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got a lot better looking her. suddenly. All right, I'm going to stand over here because half of you guys can't see me. But my name is Lynn Winter. I'm a digital strategist now, and I'll explain a little bit what that is. But I work for my own company called Manage Digital. So um, my whole career started out when my dad sat me down in the golf course and said, you know, had one of these talks with me. And since there's only been two in my entire life, one was when I told him I wanted to be a doctor. Well, we know how that turned out. The other one was this. And he sat me down one month before college and said, if you want to be successful in life, you'll become a programmer. So I didn't. And <laughs> I got extra degrees for fun. So I uh, took my 18 courses and got a chemistry degree, which actually helped me make spreadsheets later on in life. So there was a lot of value in that. Um, and then I also got a communication degree and a uh, television production minor. So I was kind of wandering about for a little bit. But I was going to show my dad that I was not going to become a programmer, for sure. And you know, being an accountant, he was highly disappointed. Um, so I went off to public television for a while. I spent eight years at a public television station in Minnesota, um, worked on uh, small local projects and big national projects, and basically did project management um, with four or five different titles throughout the years. But um, I got the benefit of being in a highly structured uh, role. Uh, television has been around for a really long time. So everybody knows why to come talk to me. Everybody knew why to hide from me. Um, and it was a highly respected role, so it, it was great. There was a lot of mentorship of, around that as well. Um, towards the end, we started making websites. That's one of the uh, claimed ones in the picture there, where I got from the Wayback Machine. Um, we essentially used you know, static HTML and put them up there, and then nobody touched them ever again. So um, I, I believe that they do something different, but I, I'm not there anymore. In 2008, I went over and found Drupal. I joined a small company called Gorton Studios, which is no longer around. Um, but they did all um, Drupal websites for nonprofits. Uh, my role it was employee number five. And what they did is they sat down two different people and said, OK, what are all the things you hate about your job? Write them down. And they made a job description. <laughs> and I'm not even kidding. Like That's literally what they did. Turns out I like the things, but it kind of made my life a little hard because nobody really respected the role and it was all the crap they hated to do. So it was a bit challenging at first, but you know, I kind of dug in, started to make the role myself and said, OK, well, I'm going to find opportunities. So I made a point to learn as much as I could that was outside the project management field. I did um, quality assurance testing, Google Analytics stuff, wrote user manuals, um, did information architecture, started doing content strategy, did sales. And, and it was great because it was a super small environment. I could do all those things. But it allowed me to be more than what they thought as just a project manager. Um, but I had a hard time. I would go to Drupal conferences. My first one was in Chicago in 2008. I literally found like a couple project managers, which one of them is in the room, and like stocked them down. It was super awkward. And, but there was nobody. There was no PMs anywhere. And so it was really hard. And eventually, I kind of found my clan. And one of them was going to uh, the National DPM Summit, which I think everybody up here has gone to. Um, and it's a great place to like just learn things from people and just hang out with the people that do your thing. Show up at 8 o'clock with everyone with your laptops in the front row because we're all dorks like that. Um, but it was awesome. Um, but today I'm, I'm doing something really different. Um, I started going freelance last summer and tried to figure out um, it was unplanned and untimed. So I was in the path of trying to figure out what do I want to do? Do I want to get a PM job? Uh, something else. My last job for a couple years was managing the digital team. 
Uh, and from all my connections that I've made in the Drupal community, I've been able to um, further on with my content strategy work. So right now I do like half content strategy, half project management, some information architecture. Um, and just freelance, and it's kind of allowed me, what we needed was more time with our family at this point. Excellent. So like these guys, I also had a varied career path into project management. Uh, I'm originally from the East Coast, I'm from Boston, and I studied broadcasting, and I was a radio news anchor, and uh, I found my way into advertising at a bachelorette party when I said, radio pays nothing, what do I do next? And so I found my way there too. So. Um, we have a lot, uh, we have one more person to speak, that's Darren, he's here, and then we'll get into some questions. Hi. So by now, you can hear some themes coming up. I think if, if you wanted to get the shortcut of my story, you would take everything they all said and put it in the bag, shake it, and that would be me. Um, but my, uh, I work for Lullabot, I should say. Beep, Lullabot. Um, we are a, a design and strategy and development agency that uh, does big Drupal sites for publishers with a lot of content, big content problems. We'd love to talk to you. Um, so that fat child with the hair grew up and wanted to become a jazz musician. And, uh, and so he played saxophone. Look at that. <laughs> look at that permed hair. Look at, look at those contacts. That's what happens when your mother plans your senior picture. Um, so uh, I went to college for jazz. Uh, I started a family. I needed a job. And I fell into to computers. I was a sysadmin. And then I became a programmer. So over the course of the last 18 years or so, I went from programmer to dev lead to I don't get to touch code anymore at all. And I said, oh, this is, this is not good. And so I changed jobs. And I, I went and got trained by Lullabot before I was ever working for them uh, in Drupal 6. So approximately 2010, I went from manager back to developer, taking a, theoretically a step backward, but it's what I wanted. And uh, within a year, I was, I was a manager again. <laughs> there wasn't anything I could do, because apparently I was willing to talk to clients. I was willing to use spreadsheets, and that's what it takes. So, um, so I became a project manager, in effect, uh, working at, a, at an agency in Portland, Oregon, uh, just because it was happening that way. And the person who was actually, quote unquote, the project manager, all they did was come up behind you. Amber's laughing, because she knows who this was. Um, <laughs> they would come every three or four days and stand over your shoulder and ask you if it was done yet. And that was the entirety of, of their tactics. They were not supporting the team or any of that stuff. So I learned a lot of things not to do. Meanwhile, I was account managing and managing the ticket queue and a bunch of other stuff together. So at that point, I was sick of the place I was at and I went to apply at Lullabot, like I'll just throw my hat in the ring and maybe they'll hire me. And uh, the day they, they asked for code samples to further the interview, they also posted a project manager job. And so uh, in the course of that interview, my phone died sitting in my car. Like there was just a whole bunch of stuff. They hired me anyway, and the rest is history. So I became a project manager full time. Um, I can't see what I said. Oh, yes, yeah, sometimes you tank a project. This is the part of, uh, of my life where I sucked for approximately 18 months because I went from, I'm kind of a project manager to, oh crap, I'm a project manager. And all the things that I didn't know that I didn't know were suddenly revealed to me because, not just because I was incompetent, but because I, I pulled the short straw on like every client gig that, that Lullabot got for about 18 months. So I got nightmare client after nightmare client and my, my bosses and, and, and peers were very supportive as I figured out, oh, okay, I can't say yes to everything. Because that's what developers do. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Developers are like, yeah, we can do that. We can build it. And then project managers are supposed to be like, yeah, we're going to need to hang up the phone and talk for a minute, right? So I learned not to say yes on the first request, right? Go about, talk to the devs, get an estimate, come back and say, well, we've decided that that's not in scope because I just read my SOW. Um, so all those kinds of do's and do nots, I sort of picked up over those 18 months. And I went from, this is painful, to, oh, we have a fixed bid project that looks scary. Give that to Darren, <laughs> which I'm not sure I'm happy about, but that is what it is. So I began to suck less. Um, and things began to go well. And I, uh, all along the way is part of the other undercurrent here. I've, I've been interested in the history and um, the where did we get agile from? Where did we get waterfall from? All those kinds of things were I was really curious about. I was a self-taught developer and I was sort of was a self-taught PM in that respect. 
So I studied a whole bunch on the on how does all this stuff work and where does it come from and why does it work the way that it does? What is Agile actually trying to answer? So that all began to inform what I was doing to the point that it, I wasn't hurting anymore and I wasn't say, having sleepless nights and my team wasn't mad at me and all those things were good. So with that, then I've been able to sort of transition in, at the, the Digital Project Management Summit and things like that begin to join the community of project managers and try to give back some of those lessons. And, um, things like that, and I'm even sort of in the, the same direction that Lynn has gone. I'm, I'm branching out into other disciplines like content strategy and trying to understand some of that better for the for the benefit of all the projects that I'm on. So, um, and I still play the saxophone. Ta-da! <laughs> so. right. Thank you very much, everybody. So I'm going to ask a few questions here before we throw it out to all of you guys to start Q&A. Uh, we have a couple of panelists here who are former developers and a few that aren't. How has being a technical PM or a non-technical PM uh, made your life either easier or harder when Drupal is the platform? Developers? Hands going up all over the room. Oh. Can we play for not developers? Sure. Okay. So, uh, so when I started with the Drupal Association, um, there was like four or five people who worked there. And so when we had to have a website in order to run DrupalCon and do registrations and things like that, and for whatever reason, that fell to me. And so by, by like my third day on the job, I was like hands in the back end of the, the Drupal website and learning like as I was going along. And through the course of uh, my time there, we took it from this like kind of broken COD site, if you are familiar with COD, it was tears. Um, but it's, we've since gotten it to the, like, the beautiful place that it is now. But throughout the, that entire like three year period, we took this busted, broken site that had been patched together by like multiple companies, like sparing three hours at a time to come build things. Uh, and I learned Drupal that way. No one ever sat down and showed me what a content type was. I just learned to click around. Uh, and because of that, because I became like the site administrator and the like the person who goes and changes things and babysits this like living website, uh, I can now now like that. Was, if I hadn't have had any of that background, I would have never been able to jump in and be able to talk to clients about like what things are, like well, how taxonomy works, how content types, like the the amount of configuration that you can do, all the different options. And because of that, I can actually step in for my clients. And we don't just do like a checklist with the client. I can just sit, I can just assume like knowing what they're trying to accomplish. Like I can sit with a developer, skip the step of talking with the client and getting the proper configurations out for the site that they want. Yeah, I can I, I can start at least. I'm not going to speak for you. Okay, I'm just going to speak for me. And what I'm going to say is, is the big challenge I think with getting becoming a PM. Uh, uh, developers, will you put your hands back up in the air? Hey, all of you suck at doing estimates. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, I took that into my project management role. Um, I I would get on the phone with a client and I would say, oh, that's 15 minutes, or that's 30 minutes, or that's a day. And then, you know, immediately get off the phone and talk to somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. And they'd say, you just committed us to like three months uh, in for 15 minutes. And so and then I have to get back on the phone and tears. Um, <laughs> uh, I think that's one. I think the second is, is, is uh, I think one of the challenges that I had as I, th I think some I think like coming from a technical background is kind of obvious the, the benefit that you bring to a project. So I'm going to talk about the things that are not benefits but liabilities and I think that the the the, the other liability uh, that I, I brought was that I would get you know we would start talking through like a client would bring an idea about what would need to be done and rather than asking why I'd immediately pivot to like how and that was I think problematic and I think it was problematic on two fronts one is, is that I wasn't actually going to try to address the problem that they needed to have addressed I was just trying to fix the thing that they were talking about and two is that I would get into super technical jargon land that was wide, like not useful for anybody on the other end of the phone call. And so, you know, rather than trying to think through things in plain English, I would, you know, start talking about, you know, oh, fieldable entities and all that, you know. I, that's a second reference. I do know something else about Drupal. Um, 
I would just add too, I have never been a technical project manager. I knew enough to be able to know when I have to ask questions or not, but I always felt like embarrassed about it for a long time for some reason. Like I, w I didn't know what all the developers knew because I was surrounded by people that did that. But if you're a non-technical project manager, I wouldn't worry about that. You just bring something different to the table. So it's not, it's just not a requirement. So the, my only contribution to all this is that there's probably a balance point between like me as a, as a technical person who's now managing projects. I need to restrain myself, like Joe says, from involving myself in the architecture. Sometimes the project needs me to know that. Sometimes it does not. And so letting the devs do what they do uh, requires a force of will on the part of somebody who knows what the developer does. So sometimes you got to not do that. On the other side, uh, I have to study to know how to work with designers better. I need to know some of their craft. I'm no designer but I need to know enough of their craft that I can support them. And the same is probably too in the other direction, that you need to know enough, as Stephanie talks about, of, of what's happening under the hood with Drupal that you could represent a developer's perspective and, and communicate with them, but not have to make the decisions for them. So there's this like sweet spot, depending upon the team you have and, the, and all that kind of stuff. But knowing my proclivity is to like jump into those details is a, a way to avoid trouble, because you know, you'll get in trouble otherwise. <laughs> Show of hands, how many folks here are certified Scrum Masters working in Agile? Do we have any PMIs? All right. Nice. Uh, so question for you guys. Do certifications matter or is on-the-job training more Who's certified here? Not certified. Joe. Yeah. yeah, I'm certified. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Please. No, not at all. They don't matter. Um, no, I, I think there's some people who... Oh, oh, I've got... No, I worked for a staffing company for years. They don't matter in practice, but they matter when you're applying to them. No, that's right. I mean, okay. So just... Uh, still I'm going to repeat that. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the comment for the recording was that... Uh, I think everybody in the room heard that, but the thing is is that, yeah, it doesn't matter. It matters for on your resume. It matters when somebody needs to, like, sift through a stack of resumes. Absolutely. Um, but I, I, I guess I'm answering it from a practical, like actual, because like, the certification is two days, right? And like, if 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 your project goes sideways in two days, that's a horrible project. Normally, it's projects go sideways in like what six months, nine months. Yeah, the, cert, the, the Scrum certification depends, is two days. It depends what kind you get. Yeah, no, the PMI, the, 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 the PMI is a course. Yeah, that's a course. But okay. Let me just, let me be, let me, I, I mean, okay, just see, I'm just jumping to chapter five and all my answers here. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually think that the, the, the best way to learn is by doing. I and mean, that might just be my own bias is that, you know, I was self-taught as, a, as a, a developer and the same thing with the project manager. I, you know, I, when I first met with an agile coach, I said, hey, I've always worked in agencies, you know, how do you do estimates? Um, you know, in an agile way. And he said, don't estimate. And I said, well, that's the end of this conversation. <laughs> um, but no, I, I also have like sort of a meat and potatoes brain. Joe's a spreadsheet king. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my spreadsheet foo is strong. Mm -hmm. So I will say I've, I've taken a couple of runs at studying the, the PMP materials and gotten a ton out of it. So even if you don't actually get the, um, get the certification for cost reasons or time or whatever else, especially if you're coming in as an accidental project manager, you came in as a designer or a dev and you are finding yourself in project management land. There's a lot of other things that you need to be thinking about and doing as a PM that you probably were not, you don't come to naturally because you come from another discipline. Uh, so studying the PMP told me a bunch of things that I could possibly do. It provided a bunch of options. Many of them were irrelevant because the size of the projects that I was working with just were not uh, didn't demand the kind of rigor that the PMP tells you about, but it's useful to know you could do any of these things if, it, if your project needed it. And so that's, so the study of it's more probably important than the actual certification in my mind. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Are there, other than the certifications, are there other classes, are there other resources that you would recommend folks learn about Drupal, let, learn about Agile, learn about project management? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think you're going to you know, for me, you know, having someone in the mentorship role, so working with someone um, that, you know, is a senior person or has done it for a long time, that's the best way to learn from them. 
Um, you're going to run across stuff all the time that you've never done before because it's kind of like outside of the straight line of project management. And having someone else say, here's how I did it. This is an example of something. And having a network of people has been the best way. I've reached out to, since I started to get to know people in the Drupal community, I've reached out to several different people over the years just saying, hey, I'm trying to do this thing now. How did you guys do this thing? And everyone's been really helpful. And that's been the best way for me, really. <laughs> Ditto. Ditto. Uh, Do you have I, I, you know, I think I think actually, I just I think uh, uh, conferences have, have been really helpful. I think the the digital project management conference, the the the, the, the DPM summit, which I think it, like it's like we work for the Bureau of Digital up here. Like it, you, you know, we're like doing a lot of log rolling for them. Um, but it's a really spectacular summit. I, I thought it was going to be like two you know two three days of spreadsheets and and Gantt charts, and uh, it really was like a. a Discussion of empathy and uh, connecting with users, and like, yeah, and, and, and a group hug too. You know, like uh, as, as project managers tend to be solitary creatures, and actually getting into a room with a bunch of PMs uh, to talk shop is really, I, th I think, very beneficial, and certainly uh, something I've gotten a lot of value out of. There's a couple of books that are useful in terms of hard resources. Um, estimation by Steve McConnell, software estimation, is a is sort of the Bible of the ways that you can go wrong with, a, with an estim, estimate process. Um, knowing that estimates are all lies, it's still a good book to read to know what are the, how to navigate that space. Um, Scott Birkin's book, Making Things Happen, is a, is a great sort of modern look at um, practical project management. Um, and then there's just a lot of resources online about how Scrum is done, how Agile is done. And uh, I, I kind of think the becoming a PM is like a progressive five to six year knowledge. Like you just sponge up a bunch of stuff while you're doing things, and you learn how to do it better. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of people online that have very like the the priest agile thing. Lots of religious opinions about it that. You know, you got to spit out some of those bones in order to get to what's really useful, especially if you work in an agency, because Agile, in a pure sense, is not really a great fit for us in an agency model. But there's a lot of good tips, tricks, tactics that you can pull from that. Mm -hmm. And um, meetup groups. Uh, I know in Denver, the PM meetup group is is really active. They meet monthly, rotating topics. That's been a tremendous resource for a lot of folks too. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys have uh, any questions? Right. And throw it out to you guys. And mm -hmm. we'll, we'll repeat it if you don't want to get up. Sure. Yeah. I can help. Uh, Broken leg and all, you know. It sounds like a lot of you are in positions that you didn't see yourself in. So if you could go back in time and prepare for your current position, if you could do that, what skills would you acquire or what things would you do to get ready for now? That's a good question. MMA. Mixed muscle. <laughs> <laughs> Joe so, and I do talk about that, like we knife fight over resources. So I think out of these guys, I'm, I'm the more like, let's get our hands messy real quick and figure out this thing. Um, so for me, I wouldn't be able to have gone back and do anything. I'm sort of just figuring it out all as I go as messily as I can. Um, I think the biggest thing is being more confident earlier about mm, this thing feels wrong, maybe I should say something, um, which I learned the hard way to, uh, now I say much earlier and I say it very loudly. Um, but like, as one of the things that you learn as, as, as a project manager is like, if your little alarm bells are saying, hey, this might be a thing, like you, you should go and explore why that makes you feel like that and then you communicate it to your team so that you can stop the burning before it actually starts. Ditto. Um, I, I think that knowing as much as you can about all the things you're going to have to manage, right? So being able to avoid stepping in a hole when a designer, you know, who may have sensitive feelings <laughs> needs to be communicated with in a way that's appropriate. Like, that doesn't look right. You know, those kinds of people skills is the, is the biggest part of, of PM. You, know, you can't learn that out of a book. You just have to be like, able to empathize. So some of some of the stuff about learning a broad range of skills is about empathizing with the struggles that each of the people on your team are going to have. Um, 
And then beyond that, you know, you fall into the rest of it, I think. I think two things that I think of is one, um, taking care of your team more. I think as a PM, you have all these things dumped on you and you're always trying to get through your stuff and that sometimes you're just coming up to your developers or, or folks on your team and just saying, oh, I need this answer, I need this and that. And you know, just making sure you're taking care of them in whatever way, whether it's like treats or, or just respecting their time and bugging them at the right thing. I think in the middle of my PM career, I really had a hard time just like, I, I need to do my job, I need to solve things, I gotta fix it, why don't you help me? And I just kept bugging people and um, that was kind of frustrating. So I had to learn that the hard way. Um, the other thing is really taking care of yourself. I think as a PM, a lot of us are in the role of like, I'll just burn myself all the way. You know, it's different. Developers need to stop after eight hours and I, could, I can go 12 hours because I got to get that ready for tomorrow because if I don't get it ready for tomorrow, then they won't have work to do and then we'll be screwed the next day and then it goes on and on and on. So I found myself for years now just working way too much. I mean, it's partly my personality, but there's just this thing of like, I've got to have it lined up or the ship goes off and then who has to deal with the ship being off? It's, it's me, so it's this kind of like weird, vicious cycle. And if you don't have the sport around you to say, you need help, you need to shift your work, you're kind of in trouble with that. Does anybody else have a question? Put a contention out there and see what you guys, if you agree or disagree. I would say that PMs are born, not made. And what I mean by that is often it's some person has an overdeveloped sense of responsibility and just can't help themselves. And like all of you sort of emerges into this role. I'm curious if you think this is something that can be taught well or if, if you sort of feel like most PMs come organically out of whatever else they were doing because they simply can't help themselves. I, I have opinions about this. Uh, I, I think that anybody can be a PM, but there's a definitely a personality type that makes them be not bad. Uh, <laughs> because anybody can have a spreadsheet, anyone can go through the motions of being a project manager, and one of the reasons I didn't want to be a project manager is that I associated so much badness with people who just sucked as project managers. Um, but yeah, it's, for me, it's a personality type. Like, you're the kind of person who is always going to be in first, outlast, and constantly everything in your head while everyone else is like out drinking a beer you're like planning the next day's meeting and you're ready to be up before god getting the agenda ready and like that's just what you're gonna do and you just you can't teach that and you're lifting the beer at the place where you're doing the next thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> my my first uh on-site retreat with lullabot we went to waffle house everybody knows waffle house Yes, we went to Waffle House and there's a bunch of developers and we're sitting around the table and somebody ordered a side of bacon and it didn't come. And I was like, don't you want your side of bacon that you ordered? And they were like, no, 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 it'll be fine. It's not a big deal. And I'm like, waitress, where's this person's bacon? And they're like, man, you PM the shit out of that because I was new on the team. And so th there's just something about like, we're just going to make sure everybody's okay. Uh, and that overdeveloped sense of responsibility is um, a good way to put it. I was um, last night uh, texting 10 people to make sure they knew where the karaoke bar was and, and how to get there and what time we were going to be there. And then if I didn't get there in time, I texted more people back to say I was showing up late and somebody was like, what are you doing? I'm like, I, I got to get people together. This is how they're going to know where to go. And it just it doesn't stop. I put that together. <laughs> so, uh, it's that, I mean, I don't want to be the... Okay, now I'm the one stealing the microphone. So I... I I PM'd this entire week. I have a color-coded by day Google map of where we're going, what we're doing, and who I need to ping to make sure that everyone is aware of the parties and making sure that the parties are actually happening. <laughs> there you go, just drop it, just throw it, be done. Anybody else? I think that answered that question. <laughs> So now that we've established that there's a sort of neurotic personality type associated with being a project manager, how do you balance that out with some self-care and managing stress and, um, make, and setting boundaries and um, you know, taking care of yourself? I got out of project management because it was too damn stressful and I couldn't handle it um, anymore. So what are your thoughts on that? 
Um, well, I cheated. I didn't handle it. I did everything. I also have a second career shooting sports, so I, I can do it all because I want to be the super mom of the world. Um, but when I got laid off, I kind of said, okay, enough's enough. Like, I need to figure out the balance for my family and myself. And now, while I'm still doing a lot because I decided to put on a conference for PMs, um, <laughs> I, I have a better balance. I have choices. I'm making decisions and, and, and re-trying to establish that. So I don't have the answer. So if someone else here or anyone else wants to share. Joke, joke. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> just don't sleep anymore. Is, you know, self-care. Like this is, you know, so like balance is like, you know, two even weights. And also, you know, you hit balance, early stasis when you have like one heavy weight and no weight on the other end. So just work all the time. Just no vacation. Yeah. yeah, no, you're you'd be a you're a joy to work with with every person when you're burned out. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I think I think in all seriousness, uh, defending the project, like uh, defending the project means uh, it means you know, not just not just making sure that the client is happy, but also making sure that the, you know, that, that leadership knows that, that they only have so many resources, that understanding that, you know, that the, the day ends at 5 p.m. and everybody's gotta go home, you and know. Leadership doesn't know how many development resources are. Leadership also knows how many PM resources, because I think that's where oh. we forget to tell them. We just say, oh, we don't have enough design time or UX or development, and we forgot to say, Oh, and I'm totally burned out. There's no PM time. You need to get some help yeah. here. It's it's never. I mean, I don't know. I've never yeah. hired a contracted PM ever to help support. Yeah. where I am, but every other role I have. No, that's right. And I think uh, you know, I, I I was guilty of burning out really hard. I think uh, you know, a while ago, I had 15 projects, and we had not enough PM resources, and we were we were uh, like we were just burning the candle at both ends, and it it, it really showed in the work. You know, because uh, you have to, you know, uh, uh, it's really important to make sure that the, the team is taken care of and that they've got, you know, that they've got enough running room to actually do the work that's best for them. And that means, you know, making sure that there's, you know, acceptance criteria in the tickets, that there are tickets, that the tickets are organized, that the client has been communicated with. Oh, are you jumping in? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so I I did burn out when I was working at the Drupal Association. Uh, I had two Drupal cons happening simultaneously around the clock, which meant like different time zones, and there was no support. It was me, and I was in charge of customer service and marketing and whatever. Just like the list went on and on, and my days would start at like five or six in the morning, and they would go until I passed out. And when I left, they hired two people to replace me, and that was partially my fault. Like, because I just kept taking things on and kept taking things on. And so when I moved to Amazie, I made the conscious decision of my laptop doesn't come home. That was like the biggest thing that I would always take my laptop home and it's work. So my laptop never came home with me and then I made sure to set that boundary kind of going in of five o'clock means day is over. I'm not gonna work. I'm not gonna let you make me work. And the good thing is, is that you know, I have a company that supports that. Like they don't want to have people burning at both ends. And so part of it is like your responsibility and also part of it is making sure that you're putting yourself in a place where people care about you not dying. Dying to jump in. She could drop the mic again. I yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, I've, got I've got nothing, I've got nothing. So I mean, the, to wrap up that theme, suffering is a wonderful teacher and Hopefully, if you hear us having suffered on this kind of a thing, lost sleep, worry, anxiety, um, long days, all that kind of stuff, that comes from a culture that your company is supporting, right? So I want to say to you, if you're in that, it's not your fault, and it's okay for you to stop. Like, you could walk away from your desk at 5 o'clock and say, I didn't have time for that, and whatever the consequences may be, it ultimately flows upward to your leadership at your company and is not on you. And then you know, at some point, that may mean you have to change organizations or whatever else. But the really, the really heavy that I'm trying to lay on is just to say, you think the buck stops with you, but it really doesn't. You're there to make sure you can do the best with what you've got and take care of your developers and your designers and all that stuff the best you can, and then report upward that there's something wrong. And to, just to echo what Stephanie said, you've got, uh, a rumbling in your tummy that something's wrong, just say that right away. 
and that was probably the biggest lesson I learned in my year and a half of, of, of hating life, was <laughs> I feel like something's wrong. If I sit on it, if I sit on it, I mean, it lasted longer than that, but that was just the, when I was a full-time PM. When I felt like something was wrong and I sat on it, because maybe that'll make it better. It's not going to get better. It will not get better. So when you feel bad about something and you think that something is wrong, even if you can't put your finger on it, talk about it long enough and loud enough that it becomes clear. And then let everybody know who needs to know. So, Lynn. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna this stop. burnout question is going on and on. Yeah. <laughs> no, Lynn, you actually brought up a really good point. I'd like to go there. Uh, contract PM. So can you, be, can, can you talk about freelancing in this community? I mean, how successful can a PM be as a freelancer? Yeah, so when I um, left my job, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do because I had done so many different things. So I actually had several phone calls with people that were doing contract PM work and how they went about and got the work and started. Um, it's definitely viable. A lot of people are doing it out there. Um, what seems to be the best model is that you have two or three different agencies because every time I work with, right now I have two agencies I'm working with, um, but every time you're working with a different agency, they have a different process. So I am putting myself into that process and figuring out how to get in and out or how to manage a new process. And so it's a lot of context switching as well as right now I'm on Slack for one company, I'm on HitJet for another company, I'm Toggle for my time over here, I'm in Jira for my time over here, I'm putting tickets into Asana, then I'm putting tickets into Jira. And, and so it's a lot of context switching, so there's definitely, you know, when you figure out like what you're gonna charge and stuff, you need to like, figure out how all the dead time you are from like switching around. The other thing that's really tricky is if, when you do the PM work, so my content strategy works a lot different because it's very like project based and I can do hours at a time, but for my the one client I'm doing PM with right now, um, I get slacks all day, every day. And it's okay, but that's how PM work goes. It doesn't say, oh, on Tuesday at three o'clock, we're now gonna PM, it starts right now. And so I've had to figure out if I'm okay with that and then I'm actually gonna talk to them about pricing these days because I'm you losing all this time being bugged, but I'm not, I can't bill it to a project. There's not really a concrete thing. So um, I do actually think that more people could be contract PM. I think it's out there if you're really solid and good, um, but definitely building up the relationships before you kind of jump out there, making sure you have a good network. Um, is kind of the way to go, whether it's like you built up a local network or you platform network or whatever it is, um, works. Yes. We, we had a, really. no. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were asking about that. I'm like, it's no, I mean, it's no big deal. I mean, everybody's so nice, but I just, I just wanted to ask the developers, um, if, or the people that were developers in a prior life, because anyone can be a developer. <laughs> if you, uh, when you moved to be a PM, if, if, if you, if you missed it, if you missed the code part of it, if, if you have any regret, and then in the same kind of breath, like what you gained moving into uh, the different role as a PM. Yes, you miss it when you don't get to do the thing you love to do, right? Whether you're a designer or a dev, you, everybody reports, I, I miss getting my hands dirty in the stuff. That's one of the reasons why you have to restrain yourself because you think, oh, I'm a PM now. I'm going to do what I used to do. No, you don't get to do that anymore. Um, I intentionally don't set up a local on my, on, on my machine, even though I could because um, lots of projects, it's better if I can't. And that way I just don't have, even have a choice about getting involved in, in some of the code level things. But every once in a while, it's, I still need to because the team's too small and I have to provide some kind of oversight or whatever. And at that level, I get to enjoy that every once in a while. And that part of my brain gets those endorphins and that's exciting. Um, the benefit on the other side, I think, is the piece of me that's not just a nuts and bolts detail developer guy who actually likes the bigger picture and likes to understand the business problems and all the other things that go into being a PM that has to gather requirements and all that. Gets lots of satisfaction from seeing the whole thing happen. And the um, way I'm wired, I think that's better in the end, so. Oh. Uh, we don't have to talk to you. No, no, no. We're okay. not a developer, so. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I miss it. Absolutely. And uh, whenever I have an opportunity, like if, it, if, if Atten needs uh, like an internal project, I will 
I will take that on myself because I'm super, I just, I really love doing that. But I also feel like I've channeled some of that into like crazy complicated spreadsheets, you know? <laughs> so I, 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 I had a developer said if I ever have a trial by, uh, by spreadsheet, I choose Joe Crespo as my champion. <laughs> I'm the mountain of spreadsheets. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm not really sure how to word this, but you mentioned about how you'll get pinged and how to bill for PM in that way and how to bring it up. Um, do you have any tips on that? Um, like how to resolve the issue right now? Well, sometimes like um, like uh, some clients like don't, uh, like from the PM perspective, like they, uh, I'm having trouble wording it, but they don't always like the the rate for PM or the the work that goes into PM. They don't really understand that side of it that a lot of PM work goes into, like that. So how do you how do you bring that up and say actually we need to bill more for PM? Yeah, I actually talked to someone today where um, an agency that actually doesn't even bill for PM time yet. So. The PM works on a whole project and, and none of the time goes to a project. What kind of floored me, which is I, I have like, because I've been a PM for so long, it frustrates me to see the lack of respect for the role and the value. And, and just because when I say, what did I do all day and I wrote emails, doesn't mean that we're super valuable. Um, as far as in the freelance space, um, I just basically, a couple of things and not sure you're asking, but one thing is I tell my clients I have other clients. So yeah, they can ping me and I might not get back them tomorrow. Um, and then for clients that need to know exactly when I'm working, I kind of block out my calendar a little bit for them so they know when they can get a hold of me. Um, but I do try to be available because I know they have questions or things to do, but you know, just with anyone that's a full-time PM, you don't need to respond to a client within one hour. You can respond to them the next day. It's completely fine unless their site is burning on fire. Um, but as far as, you know, just making sure that someone respects the values of the PM time, I mean, if somebody doesn't in general, that's really hard. Um, but I, my plan is to just kind of give them a sense of what I'm doing and, and how that's impacting my time and, and negotiate what I think makes the most sense for that. Um, with my freelance stuff, I always, I figure out something that works for them. So I do most of my stuff hourly. Um, just because God knows what it's going to take. I'm not going to be able to estimate that, how much time you want to mine. But I let people know every week what I'm doing. So um, I'm doing these things. Either I enter my time directly into their system or I send them an email and just say, here's what I'm working on. Here's my, how much time I spent. Um, and if I have a new idea, like I want to do all, you know, budget reports for all their clients every week. Here's what I think it will take. Should I do that? And then kind of let them make choices because if they don't want me to do certain things, then I don't have to do it. Um, but if I work with someone that doesn't really... Uh, value the things I think needs to happen to make a project successful, then I just kind of part ways with that. Does that yeah. maybe answer? Okay. In a past life, uh, when I was a developer, I had somebody, I had a, my, my boss said to me, um, you know, if you go to sleep and dream about a project, wake up and update your timesheet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I mean, you know, it, it, but the point being that like, you know, every minute you spend on a project is a value, is, is valuable time you spent on this project. Well, not every minute, but I mean, most of the time you spend on a project is valuable. You're adding value. You're, you're planning it out. And as a, in a PM role, you know, those Slack messages are, you know, those are like little micro adjustments on the project that is averting disaster. And also at an agency, my last role, I was the production director, so I have PMs and design and UX and developers under me, and I got to make a lot of choices, and I wanted to show the PM line. I hear so many agencies hide it under as some sort of overhead, and it's like, because the role, role isn't valuable, we're not doing anything, people are afraid, and the first thing people need to do is just put it out there. This is a valuable asset. You guys are going to make or break by working with this person. They're going to guide you to the finish line. So we should make sure that our agencies are proud to show that and, and charge that time. To Makes that me end, angry. I'm going to speak loudly. To that end, I've been working with Joe in our scopes, in our actual contract. Not only do we have the, our ads philosophy about project management, but we've actually taken it to Lynn's point to itemizing exactly what value the PM provides, You know, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly activities. And um, so you have to have the agency stand behind it, support it, and, uh, and advocate for it. 
Yeah, so um, when I started with Amazie Labs, I didn't know, uh, I've never done agency life before, and so like just learning how we do like pricing and stuff was brand new to me. Um, and apparently what we do is weird. So everything that we do is one flat rate. And PMs, junior devs, regular devs, designers, whatever. Uh, and apparently people do like tiered or like PM gets a different percentage or whatever. Uh, everything we do is one flat rate. That's what we tell the clients, done. Um, and then one thing that we do with the, um, with estimations, um, when we like start our initial estimation, is we include, we, since we are very like agile forward or whatever, um, instead of having a PM line, we have a scrum line, and, so, and all of the billing that we do towards PM is actually like built into the, the scrum elements um, line item of the project. And if you're looking at, um, at just the line items of things that we're gonna be delivering, you're like regular number, regular number, regular number, and then you get to scrum and it's like triple everything else. Like if you're looking at it and you're just like, where's the big number? That's the hugest number. Like we're very loud about, we're gonna spend tons and tons and tons and tons of time here because this is super, super important to making sure that all the other things are what you want them to be. Uh, last question awesome lightning round <laughs> okay so and this might be a loaded one but several of you mentioned that your agile evangelist it's changed your life i think somebody even said so i'm interested in what does agile mean to you um and i guess to give you some context on why i'm asking or how i'm interested in that so i'm in higher ed in the public sector and in higher ed and the public sector, we do love our certifications and we love our methodologies and our processes. And sometimes I think there's a tendency to get wrapped up in those things and kind of miss the point behind um, Agile, um, get wrapped up in the scrum and get the you know, prayer beads or whatever you said it was, the robes and all that. So I'm curious what, what it means to you, what tools and techniques you find most valuable and to what extent you follow some of those things? That's not a short answer, but I'm gonna go <laughs> quick and then go loud. Um, I believe in the uh, big agile, uh, big A agile principles, um, but most of my work is more appropriately in a water gile style. Um, there's just, I've worked with nonprofits most of my career and there's just not too many situations where that would be appropriate. Um, there are the right times, but um, I am more of a believer of there should be some sort of cap, some limit, we should get somewhere at some point and not um, continue to iterate, um, mostly because they don't have budgets. I think from a, from a definitions standpoint, I, I believe Agile is a set of practices that can be applied to a set of problems. Um, and historically speaking, this is where I nerd out, right? Um, push up the glasses, all that stuff. Um, Agile was a response to a certain way of doing things, and it needs to be understood in that context. So like, if it was bad in 1995 when they came up with the Agile Manifesto and all the different things, Scrum and XP and all that, um, it helps to understand how Agile could be applied if you know what it was in response to. So th there's a history lesson to, to research and deal with there. But basically, not everything in, a, in, in like the religious order of Agile is actually applicable to every context. And so you have to pick and choose the tactics. Great. Thank you, Lynn, there. Oh, and then uh, we're supposed to say. So um, I, I think most of us will be at the Lullabot Pantheon party tonight. Lullabot Pantheon party tonight. If you are, PM. we'd love to meet folks. Um, come talk to us. And uh, we can geek out on PM stuff. Um, but I also need to mention, um, we'd love to get some feedback on the session, if it made any sense, if it worked for you guys, um, if it helped. And then there's sprints on Friday, so do sprints. But thank you guys, and if you have more questions, let us know. Thanks for coming.
minutes to jump to questions since it was only 4.20. And I oh. timed it out to jump into like 4.30. Oh, it's, it's totally okay, because I thought you guys were going to take your full five minutes, and then we I think didn't. all of you stopped at like 3, 3 and a half. Oh. So Apparently when you said jump to Q&A, I was like, oh God, we're going to be over so early. But it actually worked out really great. So you got an adapter for it, right? I do. HDMI? I tested it the other day and it works. So we'll just see if it works on this room. Well, that's why I tested it the other day and I was like, well, let's just see. And it showed up there. Yeah. 